And I guess we're live. Hello, everyone, and thanks for being with us today. Uh, this is already the seventh talk for the SUSEX Vision series. As you may know, hosting these events will not be possible without the logistics provided by the worldwide number of organizers. So once again, I'd like to thank them for their continuous work and support. So for today, I'll be your host. I'll be your host for this session. My name is Maxine, and I'm currently finishing up a PhD in Tom Baden's lab. Today, I'm particularly pleased to receive Catherine Franke. She, my senior, in a sense, as Catherine completed her PhD in 2016 under Tom Baden and Thomas Solot's revision at the University of Tübingen. In 2017, she received from SFN the Nemco Prize in Cellular and Molecular Neuroscience for the work covered in her PhD thesis, Functional Characterization of the Excitatory Pathways in the Mouse in our retina. Since January 2017, Catherine had been a junior research group leader at the Benstein Center for Computational Neuroscience and the Institute for Ophthalmic Research in Tumingen. Her work focuses on how cells in a early visual system act together in complex neuronal circuits to extract relevant visual information. And today we're looking forward to a talk about retinal cycle functional diversity and the role in chromatic processing. So feel free to use a YouTube chat to comment or to ask questions to our guests. They will be answered at the end of the talk. So, hello, Catherine, and thank you for accepting our invitation today. Yeah, hi, hi Maxime, and hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, giving me the opportunity to present some of my work that I did during my PhD and since uh, I have my own group here at Tübingen. So I will now start uh, sharing my screen. Okay. All right. So um, what I want to talk today um, is uh, what the eye tells the brain, uh, visual feature extraction in a mouse retina. All right. So like um, all sensory systems, the visual system builds an internal representation of the outside world by extracting relevant information from the environment. And here it is important to consider that relevant um, depends on the species specific needs of the animals. So this uh, is nicely illustrated by this picture here, where, um, for example, the owl needs to have a very high spatial resolution to detect uh, prey like the mouse from a large distance in the sky. And this is especially important when the mouse is located in a more natural environment. In contrast, the mouse might not care so much about high resolution, but uh, it needs to detect large um, approaching predators from above. And this kind of visual feature extraction already starts in the retina. So the retina is a layered neural tissue located at the back of the eyeball, and uh, the visual image is projected out to the retina by the optics of the eye. In the retina, the photoreceptors uh, first transform the um, light into electrical signal, and this electrical signal is then forwarded to, uh, is then transmitted from the bipolar cells to the retina's output neurons, the ganglion cells. And this um, vertical excitatory pathway is modulated um, by two classes of inhibitory neurons, the horizontal cell in the outer retina and the amacrine cells in the inner retina. So in general, um, this retinal blueprint is highly conserved across um, vertebrates with some uh, species specific modifications, of course, like for example, the fovea in primates and uh, that's present in primates and also some bird species. In contrast to uh, most other sensory system, uh, sensory systems, the uh, sensory information is uh, highly processed in the retina before it is sent to the brain. And this is why the retina is also considered a mini uh, brain in a dish. So here the question is, um, how does the retina process this information? Uh, or in other words, uh, what does the um, eye send to the brain? So the classical view is that the receptive fields of retinal neurons um, have a center surround receptive field structure, meaning that they, um, these neurons are excited by a light spot within their receptive field center, increasing their spiking activity, while they are inhibited by light in their uh, surround, um, decreasing their spiking activity. And then each pixel of the incoming image would be filtered by these uh, center surround kernels before transmission to the brain. However, already um, very early work has uh, shown that receptive fields of retinal neurons uh, might be more complex than that. 
So for example, in the study, what the frog, uh, frog's eye tells the frog's brain, uh, Latvian and colleagues identified uh, um, retinal output neurons that responded specifically to a small dark spot moving in its receptive field, while uh, independent on the uh, illumination intensity and also background motion. So this corresponds to rather a complex feature detectors, which might be ideal to detect bugs. So since then, a lot of work has shown that the retina is not just decomposing the image into many pixels, which are then relayed to the brain one by one, but instead the retina extracts uh, different uh, visual features like contrast, edges, or motion, and these different representations of the same scene are then sent to the brain in parallel. And since the first um, recordings of retinal neurons more than uh, 50 uh, years ago, there has been the question of how many feature channels exist from the eye to the brain and what do they encode. So during my PhD, we addressed this problem using the mouse as a model organism. So in general, uh, for mammals, there are very few feedback projections from the eye to the bra uh, from the brain to the eye, which is why the retina, um, the ex vivo retina, can be considered like an intact um, system. So here you can see um, the whole mounted explanted mouse retina that was electroporated with a calcium indicator, um, Oregon Green Baptist One, resulting in nearly complete labeling of this one uh, cell layer, which is the ganglion cell layer, the output layer of the retina. So then we projected um, different visual stimuli onto the photoreceptor cell layer of this um, tissue, while we recorded the light correlated activity of these neurons using um, two photon calcium imaging. And here in this movie, you can see the raw calcium changes of these cells. And we recorded different kinds of stimuli. So for each of these cells, in the end, we extracted the response profile um, in response to these different stimuli. So for example, we recorded the um, full field chirp stimulus, which consisted, consisted of a step of light and then frequency and contrast modulations, a moving bar stimulus to test for direction selectivity, and also a white noise stimulus that allowed us to um, characterize the spatial and temporal receptive fields of the neurons. So they are preferred stimulus in space and time. And for this specific cell that is also marked here in this movie, we can see that this is an off cell, meaning um, that it shows an increase in calcium and activity when the light is switched off, it also uh, nicely follows the frequency and contrast modulations of this full field chirp, is not direction selective, so shows a similar response to a bar moving in eight directions and has a relatively large receptive field. So in, these, um, in the study, we um, recorded this response profile of more than 10,000 cells and then used an unsupervised clustering algorithm to group them into functional types. And here I just want to mention that, um, so the result was um, that we obtained more than uh, approximately 32 different functional ganglion cell groups in the mouse, broadly um, classified as off cells, on off cells, fast and slow on cells. And this number of 32 was approximately um, twice the number of previous estimates, suggesting that the information channels from the mouse's eye to the mouse's brain are substantially more diverse than previously thought. And since then, in the last four years, this uh, result of ours has been um, confirmed both morphologically based on EM reconstruction data and also genetically by single cell transcriptomics. So now we can go back to the, um, to the single neurons I have showed you on the previous slide and color code them according to the functional group they were assigned to. And now in this movie, you will see the responses of these cells to the moving bar stimulus and also to the trap stimulus. And so these movies nicely illustrate that already a very simple stimulus like a moving bar or chirp stimulus differentially activates these different cell types um, indicated by the fact that these different colors light up at different times uh, of this visual stimulus. Okay. So at that point, uh, we uh, might have the question, so why um, are there so many different retinal output channels to the brain? And so when we plot here the, um, the on or off preference of the different functional groups versus the preference for local or global stimuli, we can see that our functional groups cover this um, relatively simple feature space like more or less homogeneously. 
meaning that each of these um, functional groups responds only to a highly specific um, combination of these two visual features. So this suggests that what the retina does, it decomposes the visual input into many output channels, and each is selective for one or very few visual features. And so um, computational studies suggest that this pathway splitting uh, reduces redundancy and therefore provides an efficient code to the retina. So in the following, I want to, I will focus on the mouse as a model system, but I just want to briefly mention that the number of retinal output channels to the brain uh, varies across species. And so for example, in mouse with more than uh, 40 different output channels compared to, for example, primate where in the central retina, we only have uh, four to five different, uh, four to five dominant uh, cell types. And there has been since a long time this concept, um, the dumber the brain is smarter the retina, suggesting that uh, lower vertebrate species um, have a smarter retina, uh, while like higher vertebrate species like primates, for example, might have a more linear retina and relocate more complex computations like direction selectivity to the cortex. And I just want to highlight um, this uh, recent paper from Stefan Denis' lab, where um, they um, te investigated this concept computationally, which is, I think, a very nice example how um, deep neural networks can help us to test like uh, concept co conceptual ideas we have in visual neuroscience. All right, so, um, so far I've shown you that there are approximately 40 different uh, ganglion cell types in the mouse retina. So the question is, how does the retina generate such a functionally diverse output? especially considering that only two synapses upstream, we only have three types of photoreceptors. So uh, in the following, I want to um, show you three different studies that I worked on that address these questions from different angles. And the first study um, addressed the functional diversity of bipolar cells, which transmit the information from the photoreceptors to the ganglion cells. So here you can see a morphologically reconstructed bipolar cells from the mouse retina and the different types mainly differ with respect to the stratification of the axon terminals in this synaptic layer called inner plexiform layer or IPL. And uh, to record the output of all these uh, neurons, we express the glutamate indicator iGluSniffer throughout the whole um, inner um, plexiform layer, which you can see here and then recorded their responses to visual stimulus like a noise stimulus. So we use these responses um, to the stimulus and a local image correlation to then um, estimate regions of interest in this uh, exemplary scan field. So here you can see a region of interest mark with different uh, regions highlighted in colors. And in this uh, study, we were able to show that these different regions correspond to the output of single bipolar cell axon terminals and that within one scan field, we can record the output of different bipolar cell types. So here you can see now the response of a single axon terminal to um, two versions of the trap stimulus you have seen before. So the local trap stimulus um, is uh, spatially um, limited and mainly activates the excitatory center um, provided, uh, mediated by excitatory input from photoreceptors the, at the dendrites of bipolar cells. In contrast, the full field trap stimulus is a larger stimulus and in addition also activates the inhibitory surround mediated mainly by um, inhibitory input to the axon terminals of the cells. And this uh, additional inhibition results in um, a different response profile of the cells. So in the study, what we found is that uh, if you look at the output of different bipolar cell types of the same response polarity, like for two on cells, type six and type nine, you can see that their output is highly correlated, indicated here by a high correlation coefficient. So and there the question is, so why would you invest into many of these different cell types if they actually respond the same to visual stimulus? However, we found that upon this full field stimulation, these responses get decorrelated. And in this specific case, for example, one type gets much more transient, whereas the other one is more sustained. And this finding that full field um, stimulation decorrelates bipolar cell was also um, the case for um, an exemplary pair of off bipolar cells and in general across um, all bipolar cell types. 
So bipolar cell functional diversity relies on full field stimulation. And here, um, the next question is, so what is the neural correlate of this decorrelation? I already uh, on a previous slide mentioned to you that um, the full field stimulus, in addition to activating the center mediated by photoreceptor input, it activates the surround of the bipolar cells. And uh, previous studies have demonstrated that this uh, bipolar cell surround is mainly mediated by wide field GABAergic amacrine cells. So to test whether these cells provide um, the decorrelating input to the cells, we performed pharmacological experiments where we blocked these cells specifically using a GABA um, receptor antagonist. Here you can see the response of one uh, exemplary region of interest in response to the local stimulus and the full field stimulus. And you can see that you have very different response profiles. So upon uh, blocking these um, GABAergic cells, however, the cells, uh, the res responses of the cells get much more um, correlated. And this was again true across all different bipolar cell types. So what this showed is that uh, white field GABAergic amacrine cells provide uh, decorrelating inhibition to bipolar cells. And on a more general level, this study um, highlighted the fact that bipolar cell functional diversity requires an interplay of excitatory and inhibitory inputs. All right, so this uh, first study showed, um, so when we go back to the question, how does the retina generate a functionally diverse output? This first study showed that actually inhibitory um, inputs from amacrine cells play a major role in diversifying the signal in the inner retina. So next, we asked the question whether there are also cell type specific intrinsic properties that might um, help to um, increase the diversity of retinal signals. So from um, cortical and retinal work, we know that the output of a neuron is critically uh, dependent on how the inputs are integrated in the dendrites of the cells. And uh, this is why um, we next, uh, however, it's so far, really not clear whether there are cell type specific um, dendritic integration profiles that help diversify signals across neuron types. And so in this next study, we focused on two cell types, the transient of mini cell and the transient of alpha cell, which receive um, overlapping excitatory inputs and asked the question whether they have cell type specific dendritic processing uh, in these two cell types. And the study was performed by two PhD students, Yandi Ran, who was, um, who was co-supervised by Thomas Euler and me, and uh, Shi Wei, who was a PhD student of Philip Behrens' lab. So Yan Li um, filled single ganglion cells using sharp electrodes with the calcium indicator Oregon Green Bapta 1, and then recorded the responses of different dendritic regions of the same cell to a noise stimulus. This allowed us to estimate receptive fields of different dendritic regions. So here, um, relatively close to the soma, and here a distal part of the um, um, dendrite. And then uh, using a threshold, we were able to draw a contour of these receptive fields and overlay them with the cell's morphology. So Jan Lieb have, uh, repeated this procedure many times for the same cell at different dendritic regions resulting in a, a large number of receptive fields, which allowed us to systematically investigate how visual information is um, integrated in these dendrites. So to quantify dendritic integration, we looked at different parameters like um, receptive field size. Here you can see exemplary cells in different regions uh, recorded across the dendrites with their respective uh, receptive field contour. And we found that the transient of alpha cells showed a decrease in receptive field size uh, when you go from the soma further to the distal dendrites. In contrast, this uh, was not present for the transient of mini cells, which did not show a systematic difference in receptive field size. Another thing we quantified was a receptive field overlap. Um, and we found that if you record from dendritic regions at different branches of these um, alpha cells, that they don't really have any overlap, meaning that they are spatially independent. However, receptive fields always overlapped for this transient of mini cell, even if we recorded at opposite sides of the um, cell's dendritic arbor. 
And these differences are now um, highlighted in this movie here, where the red dot indicates the position that was recorded and the um, red outline um, corresponds to the respective receptive field contour. And in these movies, we go from one side of the receptive field dendrite um, to the other side. All right, and so you can uh, see that uh, when you look at the alpha cell that the receptive field position and also the size changes systematically uh, in the time of uh, throughout this movie, while for the um, transit of mini cell, receptive field size and position uh, remains relatively similar um, close to the soma. So these experiments showed that the, the cells have different uh, dendritic integration profiles. So the transient of alpha cells have isolated and spatially and temporally independent dendritic segments. Uh, in contrast, the transient of mini cells have highly synchronized spatial and temporal dendrites. So what could be the um, mechanism underlying these differences? So again, from previous work, we know that uh, back propagation of somatic signals uh, critically influences dendritic uh, signaling. So to quantify the um, signal spread from the soma to the dendrites, so Yan Li next patched these um, cells and injected somatic current, while at the same time recording the dendritic calcium signal of these cells, either close to the cell or at distal dendrites. And what you see here is the current injection protocol, the spikes recorded at the soma, and the calcium recorded either close to the soma or at the distal dendrite. And for this transient of alpha cell, we found that um, dendritic signals evoke, evoke very um, small, dend um, no, somatic signals like the spikes evoke very small dendritic um, calcium signals, especially for dendrites that are further away from the soma. And she also performed this kind of experiment in transient of mini cells and found that here the um, then somatic signals evoke much stronger dendritic signals, even for um, dendrites that are further away from the soma. And again, we quantified this by estimating the uh, mean calcium signal for a specific number of somatic spikes and found that these calcium signals are much weaker for the transient of alpha cell than for the transient of mini cells. And this is, that this is statistically significant. So this means that uh, the stronger back propagation in the transient of mini cells might synchronize their dendrites, resulting in these different um, dendritic integration profiles we have seen on the previous slide. And these different integration profiles in the end might help these cells, which um, uh, receive uh, overlapping excitatory input to process it differentially to result in different output profiles. All right. Um, okay, so, so far uh, we have uh, covered, uh, we have found that um, inhibition is um, decorrelating retinal responses, which is a general feature across all um, bipolar cell types. And we have focused on two specific ganglion cell types and found that dendritic integration can help to diversify retinal signals. But ultimately, what we want to understand is um, how does feature selectivity arise across all retinal layers? And uh, we have recently uh, tried to address this uh, question by um, focusing on the retinal circuits that extract um, color information. So color information here, uh, or color in general, is uh, like a good test case because um, it can easily be addressed by changing the wavelength of the uh, input stimulus. In general, the um, prerequisite for color vision is that uh, different cone foot receptor types or that you have different cone photoreceptor types sensitive to different wavelengths, and that the signals from these photoreceptors are somehow compared along the web, uh, visual pathway. Uh, primates, uh, including humans, have trichromatic vision, meaning that they have three different uh, cone photoreceptor types expressing the blue sensitive S opsin, the green sensitive M opsin, or the red sensitive L opsin. In contrast, uh, mice, like most mammals, have dichromatic vision, so they only have uh, two photoreceptor types, the S-cone and the M-cone. And uh, interestingly, the S-cone in the mice is, or rodents is uh, shifted towards UV sensitivity, 
And this UV shift uh, has been, or it has been proposed that this UV shift facilitates the detection of dark objects in the sky like pre uh, approaching predators. However, as we don't see UV light because our lens filters it, and also most cameras actually have a UV filter, we don't really know how the chromatic input to the uh, mouse looks like, or in other words, how the mouse sees the colored world. And this is why a PhD student in Thomas Euler's lab, he recorded these uh, natural scenes with a camera that uh, was adjusted to the spectral sensitivity of mice, allowing to also record um, the UV spectrum of these scenes. And uh, he also uh, took into account other features of the mouse visual system, like the wide opening angle on the large field of view. And if you're interested in these uh, natural movies, you should uh, watch Thomas's talk next Friday on Worldwide Neuro. So in these uh, natural scenes, what we found is that a chromatic contrast is actually enriched in the upper visual fields of these scenes. So meaning that the contrast in green versus UV band is more different in these upper visual scenes. And so what this would suggest is that mice might be able to better discriminate color uh, in this upper visual field, because why would the visual system invest into expensive circuits to extract chromatic information if this is uh, not homogeneously distributed across the uh, visual field? And indeed, uh, this is what a recent uh, paper found. So um, the authors, they looked at uh, or investigated color discrimination in mice, uh, tested three different positions along the vertical axis of the visual field, and found that mice were able to discriminate colors in the, at these three locations in the upper visual field, but not in the lower visual field. However, the uh, neural correlates for this uh, behavior in the retina is, are still unclear. And especially, and so to the most part, this is because the retina, uh, the mouse retina has actually quite a atypical and asymmetric distribution of its, uh, of its uh, obscene types. So most animals have, uh, for most animals, the different cone types and therefore the spectral sensitivity is more or less homogeneously distributed across the retina. However, uh, and while this is the case for um, UV sensitive S cones in the reti mouse retina, here indicated by the purple dots, the green sensitive M cones, they co-express the S opsin with an increasing expression, co-expression ratio towards the ventral retina. In the end, what this results in is a ventral retina that is uh, mainly UV dominant and a dorsal retina that is mainly green dominant. And now, so this uh, asymmetric distribution is not specific for mice, but can also be found in other species like rabbits and many insects. And however, since color vision requires that chromatic information is locally compared by neural circuits, it's uh, unclear how these different animals can use this asymmetric distribution to um, see colors, especially in the ventral retina where you may mainly have uh, one obscene type, which is s obscene. So therefore, um, for this next project, we wanted to look at the regional correlates of color vision in mice. And specifically, we aimed at a systematic characterization of chromatic processing along the vertical signaling pathway of the mouse retina. And this is the foot receptors, the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells. So for ch uh, chromatic stimulation, we used a uh, visual stimulator that uh, we recently described that is a, um, a DLP-based uh, projector without any LEDs, but with a light gate port, and that uh, allows you to couple in an arbitrary array of um, LEDs. And we use here a UV and a green LED matched to the mouse's spectral sensitivity. And this is important because um, conventional display devices have the, or the LEDs in conventional display devices, for example, here from a TFT monitor, really fails to activate UV sensitive um, as opsin in mice. So solutions and uh, calibration notebooks for other species like zebrafish or mouse in vivo experiments can be uh, found online. All right, so as a first step, we wanted to address the question, so how do cone photoreceptors process color information? And um, so previous studies focusing on this have mainly been performed in retinal slices where the um, inhibitory network is uh, not completely functional. 
And so here, what we want, so to record the cone output, we express the glutamate indicator iGluSniffer throughout the whole retina. And here you can see one scan field that was uh, located in the dorsal retina in the outer plexiform layer where the cone food receptors have their axon terminals. So now if we apply flashes of light, we can see that there are some activity hotspots modulating their glutamate release um, up on this slide. And based on these responses, uh, we can estimate a correlation image where each pixel here is color coded according to the correlation of neighboring pixels. And so you can already see by eye that there are different activity hotspots. And we found that um, these uh, glue sniffer activity hotspots, they um, align with uh, anatomical cone axon terminals visualized using the dye sulforodamine 101 and also form a regular mosaic suggesting that these glutamate hotspots correspond to single cone axon terminals. So now to um, investigate the chromatic processing, we use a uh, green and UV center and surround stimulus. So here you can see the mean response of a single um, cone terminal to the stimulus. And so as vertebrate photoreceptors are off cell, you see a decrease in glutamate release uh, up on the center stimulus. And because this scan field was recorded in the dorsal, green dominant dorsal retina, this uh, cell shows a stronger response to green than to UV. Now the advantage of this, our whole mount approach is that we can now also look at the pref chromatic preference of the spatially extended surround. And for this cone, you can see an antagonistic surround response that's also green dominant. S uh, showing that the cell has a center and a surround chromatic preference of green. So now we can repeat this experiment in the ventral retina and we find that uh, in line with the um, opsin expression that the cell is, has a UV dominant center response. However, if the cones have an antagonistic um, surround, this is always green dominant, uh, resulting in color opponent center surround receptive fields of these neurons. Um, here you can see um, the um, center and um, so the, all the cells that uh, Mary Lee, when she was a master student in the lab, recorded across the retina, and each cone terminal is color coded by its spectral preference, estimated as spectral contrast, which is minus one if the cell only responds to UV, and one if it only responds to green, and zero if it responds to both colors the same way. And we can see that the center responses of cones actually nicely follow the opsin gradient across the retina with UV um, re uh, sensitive responses in ventral and green sensitive responses in dorsal retina. However, the surround distribution looks very different, especially uh, in the ventral retina, the preference is um, highly shifted towards green preference. And this uh, strong difference between center and surround chromatic preference of these ventral neurons then results in color opponent field, full field responses, uh, meaning that they a single cone responds with a different polarity to a UV or green uh, full field spot. So the question, however, is uh, where does this uh, green surround response in the ventral retina come from? So previously there have, has been uh, a paper suggesting that uh, or showing that one specific type of retinal ganglion cell shows such center surround color opponent responses in the ventral retina using uh, rods signals that are relayed to cones via horizontal cells. So the inhibitory neurons of the outer retina. To test whether this was also the case in our um, experiments, we pharmacologically blocked horizontal cells with um, NBQX resulting in an increase in baseline of cone responses, but also this green antagonistic surround response was then abolished. Suggesting that uh, color opponency in ventral cones is mediated by horizontal cells that are likely driven by green sensitive rods. So to inform behavior, this uh, signal in the end has to reach the brain. So the next question is how is the chromatic information from cones processed by downstream circuits? So we next uh, focus on the bipolar cells. Um, I have already said that they um, transmit the information from the photoreceptors to the um, ganglion cells. 
And in mice, we have uh, we know that there are 14 different bipolar cell types that have their axon terminals in different parts of the synaptic layer. And ideally, we want to record the glutamatergic output of these cells at the same time. So to achieve this, um, CC, a postdoc in um, Thomas' lab, he equipped our setup with a um, with an electrical tunable lens that allows us to shift the focal plane of the laser very rapidly and record the IPL, the different uh, layers in the IPL more or less at the same time. So here you can see the response of an IPL um, to the chirp stimulus, and you can nicely see the segregation of the synaptic layer into on cells that respond to light increment and off cells that respond to light decrement, now responding in antiphase to the flicker. Again, we used um, local image correlation to draw regions of interest and confirmed previous results that um, responses at different position in the IPL have very different response profiles, ranging from sustained off cells to more transient off cells and transient on cells to more sustained on cells. Um, showing that with this method, we can use, uh, we can use this method to record the output of uh, nearly all bipolar cells at the same time. So now we combined this method with chromatic stimulation to test uh, how bipolar cells encode chromatic information. Here you can see um, the response of an exemplary scan field in the ventral retina to a uh, UV and green center and surround flicker stimulus. And uh, again, we used um, image correlation to draw regions of interest where every region corresponds to the output of a single bipolar cell axon terminal. So now we can look at the response of single terminals to the stimulus, which is, as I said, a green and UV centers around um, flicker stimulus. So we can use these responses to estimate um, stimulus kernels for UV and green center and surround, and also the mean glutamate response uh, in response to full field uh, flashes, the onset and the offset of these flashes. So I, I'm happy to go through this in detail if you have uh, questions later, but so we use these centers around um, kernels to estimate the preference of the cells, and we use these responses, the mean glutamate responses, to full field onset and offset uh, spots as a measure of color opponency. So for example, for this specific scan field, we found that most of these regions of interest are UV sensitive in line with the position of this um, scan field in the ventral retina. However, if we now look at the surround responses, they are systematically shifted um, towards green, and this difference was often more pronounced for the off layer here than the on layer here. And this very strong difference between center and surround chromatic preference in the end resulted in um, color opponent responses of these neurons, which is here indicated in red and which can be seen, for example, here. So this uh, antagonistic responses of these cells to um, UV and green can be nicely illustrated when we look at the response of this off layer in response to UV and green sign modulation of a full field stimulus, where you can see that uh, this response is uh, in perfect antiphase. In contrast to the uh, ventral retina, the dorsal retina showed mainly green dominant uh, center responses and a slightly UV shifted surround. However, as this difference in chromatic preference was much weaker, there were rarely um, color opponent cells um, in the dorsal retina, um, which would be indicated in red here. Okay, so uh, we performed these experiments across different regions on the retina and here every dot corresponds to one uh, bipolar cell axon terminal, and again, these are color coded according to center and surround, chromatic preference, and full field opponency. So these results at the level of the bipolar cells are very similar to the cones, where the center responses uh, mainly match the opsin gradient across the retina. However, the surround chromatic preference seems to be nearly inverted with a green dominant surround response in the ventral retina. And the strong difference again then results in full field color opponency here indicated in red uh, for most of these ventral neurons. So as, um, in, as a set, next step, we wanted to test whether um, there, are, as I said, there are different bipolar cell types and they could process this information differentially. 
So we therefore we plotted the difference in chromatic preference versus IPL depth, which is the synaptic layer. So here a value larger than one uh, zero indicates that the surround is green shifted and a value smaller than zero indicates that the surround is UV shifted relative to the center. And inter um, as we already uh, know, um, the ventral retina has a green shifted surround. And interestingly, this was uh, significantly more pronounced for the off layer than the on layer. And in contrast, the dorsal retina shows a much weaker difference between center and surround, and therefore uh, li little color opponent cells. All right, so um, these results show that uh, mouse bipolar cells relay the chromatic signals from cone foot receptors to the inner retina, and they do so by, uh, differently for on and off bipolar cells. So, however, is this chromatic information then finally sent to the brain? And this is uh, what Claudia, a PhD student in the lab, looked at. So she, again, used the um, bulk electroporation of Oregon green bapta one to label the cells located in ganglion cell layer and then recorded the calcium responses of these cells to um, the, a similar colored flicker stimulus. So first we recorded again the achromatic stimuli like full field trap and moving bars. And similar to the bipolar cells, the responses of these cells to a, a UV and green center and surround flicker stimulus that gives us the um, stimulus kernels and also the full field events for estimating chromatic preference and full field opponency of the cells. Again, I'm happy to go into detail later if you have questions. So then she repeated this experiment across uh, many different regions uh, on the retina. And um, here each um, dot corresponds to one cell located in the ganglion cell layer, color coded by center and surround at chromatic preference and full field potency. So basically we can reproduce the finding from the um, upstream processing layers that the center responses more or less follow the obscene gradient, although there's more variability now at the level of the retinal output, and that the surround looks very different with a strong green shift in the ventral retina, resulting um, in the fact that most color opponent retinal ganglion cells are actually located in this part of the retina. So in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that um, there are more than 40 different ganglion cell types in the mouse retina. So which are the types that then send this color opponency to the brain for driving any uh, color vision behavior? So to address this question, we assigned the cells that we recorded here to the functional groups I have shown you in the beginning of the talk using the achromatic stimuli like the chirp and the moving bars. And now here you can see the, hist the blue hist uh, hist uh, bars show, uh, indicate cells that are not opponent and the red bars indicate cells that are opponent across these different ganglion cell groups. So what we can see is that most ganglion cell groups actually contain a few color opponent cells, suggesting that this is a general feature of ventral retinal neurons that is likely inherited by the presynaptic circuits. However, there are also differences. For example, um, type 12 or type 18 have very few color opponent cells, while, for example, um, type 27 and 31 have more than 50% of the cells are color opponent. So where do these um, differences originate from? So they could come from the fact that they have these cells have differences in center and surround chromatic preference. For example, Let's consider the cells with few color opponent cells. They might have a very similar spectral preference for center and surround, resulting in very few color opponent cells. In contrast, the cells with many color opponent cells um, could have a very strong difference in center and surround chromatic preference, then resulting in many full field color opponent cells. So to test that, we use the permutation test, and I will briefly explain it, but we can also go into detail later. So we generated a distribution of expected um, percentages of color opponent cells, given the center and surround chromatic preference, but shuffling the group labels. And then we compared this um, estimation to the raw data. So for example, group number 12, uh, so this, this, the box plot shows the distribution um, 
shows the distribution of expected percentages for cells that have very similar centers around preferences as the cell. And you can see that the black dots or the real data lies within this range. However, for example, group number 18 has uh, significantly less color opponent cells uh, than other cells with the same center and surround spectral preference. Similarly, we can find a lot of um, different groups here indicated by the red arrows that have more color opponent cells than expected from their center and surround chromatic preference. So what this means or the take home message is that um, type specific, that there is type specific and nonlinear processing of chromatic center surround information at the level of the retinal output in contrast to the previous processing layers, and that this in the end results in a more diverse chromatic output to the brain. And uh, before I sum up, I briefly want to mention that um, we find that color opponency um, of single retinal ganglion cells varies across the retina. So for example, when we look at group 27, which has uh, many um, color opponent cells, we recorded the cell type across many positions uh, on the retina, and we can then um, look at the color opponency of the cell, which is here indicated by this red cells. And we find that only cells in the ventral retina are color opponent. So suggesting that the functional feature of a cell, like color opponency, might vary in one cell type depending on which part of the visual space it samples from. And this raises the question, um, of how variable functional properties of single cells types are and how we should actually define a single cell type. All right, to sum up this um, color part, so we have found at the level of the retina that most color opponent retinal neurons are located here in this ventral part. And this uh, actually nicely fits to um, behavioral data showing that mice are best at discriminating different colors here in this upper visual field, which is encoded by the ventral retina. And this difference across the visual field might be an adaptation to the input statistics, uh, which ensures that the chromatic information that is uh, enriched in the upper visual field is efficiently encoded. And so far, we have mainly used artificial stimuli to address uh, chromatic processing in these cells, but in the future, we also want to, um, we now use um, natural movies to investigate chromatic processing because there's uh, increasing evidence that, natu that a natural stimulus um, drives neural circuits differently. And therefore, this highlights the importance of using more natural stimuli in uh, understanding circuit function. All right, um, so what uh, I showed you today is that um, how does the retina generate a functionally diverse output? So the first study I showed you um, highlighted the importance of inhibitory circuits in generating diverse retinal output channels and that this is done by transforming a change in stimulus size into a change in uh, temporal response profile. So the second study showed that cell type specific dendritic integration profiles contribute to diversifying the signals in the inner retina. And finally, we um, tried uh, with the example of color to um, see how the selectivity of single visual features arises and that it progressively increases from the photoreceptors to the retinal output and that it finally involves nonlinear integration of center and surround uh, information. And I think I'm nearly done, so I will skip the last two slides and just uh, continue with um, thanking people. So um, I want to thank um, everyone who has been involved uh, in the study, mainly, um, so all of that was performed in close collaboration with uh, Thomas Euler and Philip Behrens, and all the people who have uh, helped with the experiment, like Claudia, uh, my PhD student, and Mary Lee, who has been a master student in the lab, and uh, so currently we are working on chromatic processing in visual cortex, and this is in close collaboration with Andreas Tolias and Fabian Sins and also Manolis's lab. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention and the funding sources, yeah. Well, thank you, Katrin. That was a very nice overview. I guess I will give it a second. It's here. So thanks for that. Um, 
We actually have a couple of questions. Yes. There's a very popular one. Okay. <laughs> Regarding the bipolar cell chromatic responses. Yes. Uh, so this question is from Marla Feller. Uh, this seems to mean the center, the cones, and surrounding the road will have very different dependence on light intensity. So those color potency depend on intensity. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's a very good question. So the light intensity that we have used is um, in the low photo photopic range. And um, so it's not, so for our experimental paradigm, it's not so easy to increase the light like significantly because that causes um, like bleed through um, in the channels uh, to the, like in the two photon detection channels and also decreasing it a lot might not work because we have this background illumination due to the um, two photon laser and direct and indirect activation. So what we, that's a very good question. And we performed some electrical recordings to make sure that this color opponency is also present, let's say without the presence of the two photon laser. And in these electrical recordings, we could now change the light intensities, um, like increase the light intensities or decrease and check whether this um, changes with light dependence. And so I think that's a very important point also because I think it's still, there are like controversial results about in what light regimes rods are active in mice. So at least in the low photopic uh, regime that we are using, there's now a lot of evidence that they are active, but uh, it's really unclear or it's not really tested so far in which conditions um, they are active across the different uh, log units. Um, yeah. We have another question from uh, Greg Schwartz. Yes. Uh, this is regarding the dendritic backpropagation. Yes. Is the input resistance different in the T of mini and T of alpha? Does that explain okay. the difference in backpropagation of action controls? Okay, I'm not uh, exactly sure about this answer. We would have to ask the um, PhD student, but what I can mm -hmm. say is that we um, not only did this experimental, we not only tested um, the um, mechanisms of then different dendritic integration profiles experimentally, but we also together with the student in Philip Behrens lab, we built like a bio, like simple biophysical model testing um, the contribution of morphology of the cells versus different um, conductances. And uh, I'm happy to go into detail there, but for the specific answer about the um, input resistance, I'm not, we would have to ask the student. Thanks for that. Uh, I have another one from Vikrant. Do you observe attractor-like dynamics due to the decorrelation by garbaragic cells, something on the lines of field network? Can you, sorry, can you repeat that again? If you observe something similar to a upfield network. I'm not sure I get the question. Let me, <laughs> let me open the... So who was the person who asked it? I can check it in the Google Docs. This one, the first one. Ah, yeah, okay, I see. Well, I'm actually not really sure what is meant by this um, attractor network. So maybe can we, can this person like specify or is that not possible? Yeah, or I can ask uh, this person to join in, in the chat and we can postpone this yeah. particular question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Yeah. So I have one from Brent Young. With non specific calcium imaging in a ganglion cell layer, how do you distinguish between retinal ganglion cells and displaced amacrine cells? Yes. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question. So, approximately 50% of the somata that are located in the ganglion cell layer are. Um, displaced amacrine cells. So in, in the study um, that I showed you in the beginning, for a, a subset of experiments, we performed su subsequent immunolabeling of the cells. So we labeled um, the amacrine cells using uh, antibodies and then used these immunolabels also for clustering to distinguish between ganglion cells and displaced amacrine cells. Uh, another 
Bert Schwartz is also asking, does a mouse have cone cone co-openancy or is it just all road cone? Yes. Um, so most of the evidence that we have points towards the direction that most of the opponency is really a cone rod opponency. And uh, however, so we have specifically looked for ganglion cells that, uh, for example, show a color opponent's uh, receptive field center. And we find that there is a very low percentage of cells that does have a center opponent uh, receptive field. But since we don't really center the stimulus on the receptive field of the neurons, I can't really tell you, or I can't be sure whether that's really cone-cone color opponency or not. And um, there are some other studies. I think there's one from the uh, Burson lab that shows that there's, uh, but that's also a center surround um, mechanism, not really a center mechanism like in primates. So yeah, so, so far we have relatively little evidence for that. Um, oh, okay, a quick one from Christian Puller. I can often see be a general feature across ganglion cell types on versus off, when opponency is strongly dominating in off bipolar cells. How is opponency yes. biased toward off bipolar cell in the first place? Yes, uh, that's a good question and I don't know. <laughs> so um, yeah, so why off bipolar cells have a stronger difference in center and surround chromatic prefer preference, I'm not sure. But uh, then when you look at the percentage of color opponent bipolar cells, also, the on bipolar cells are full field opponent, although, mm -hmm. they are, um, although their chromatic preference is not as extremely different as the off bipolar cells. And so the question is, so why, how can it be a general feature? So I think it is a general feature of bipolar cells. So it makes sense that it is a general feature of ganglion cells. But what is weird, for example, is that at the level of the ganglion cells, we find a lot of on, on ganglion cells have many color opponent neurons, while a lot of off bipolar cells are color opponents. So how this transformation is happening from bipolar cells to ganglion cells is not really clear, but we would be very interested to study in single types, for example, to um, do something similar with the dendrites. I mean, perform dendritic imaging of these cells and see how they are output um, is generated by the inputs from the bipolar cells, but I can't really answer this question. I will just finish this session by a quick question from Tom Baden. How dark does it have to get before UV cones see nothing anymore? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I'm not sure. So I think that's something that we should test at some point because um, so there's also some evidence that we have suggesting that UV cones, and I think Tom also finds this in zebrafish, that UV cones are much more sensitive than green cones, for example. And so we have recently done a test experiment where we just uh, kept the green intensity the same, but lowered the UV intensity by a factor of 10. And it seems like the overall chromatic preference doesn't change very much at all. So it would be interesting to like decrease the UV intensity even further. But as I said before to Mala's question, at some point we have to switch to electrical recordings because the background intensity or the activation direct and indirect from the laser might be uh, stronger than our stimulus in the end. But that's an interesting question. We do observe that in the refuge. So th thanks a lot, Katrin. Um, yeah, thank you very I much. will encourage everybody to join us on the Zoom room that was shared on the chat. So if you want to further discuss with our guests, if you want to ask other questions or just talk about chromatic processing in a retina. So we're waiting for you. And I can see that Jeff Diamond is already here. Hello, Jeff, you had a comment. Well, I had a comment, I thought. Uh, I mean, oh, oh, well, I was, I was, I, my comment was that Tom was looking good, but his appearance has <laughs> degraded substantially in the last few seconds. I, I do apologize for that. <laughs> Is that your sheep, Tom? Yes, it's, uh, it's one of my many sheep. It's, it's what we do here. <laughs> so we do sheep now? 
Hello, hello. So I just saw this passing, but Jeff, you had a comment about, I mean, I cannot find it in a chat. Oh, no, I mean, I, I was interested, um, Katrin, there, there was some, some discussion okay. going on that Marla started actually about the intensity dependence of the surround. And I mean, you're focusing on the po potential implications of chromatic surround, but you know, it's sort of, you also might have a situation where in mesopic or photopic conditions, the, the, the surround is, is a constant and the center is, is being modulated by relatively small changes in contrast. I have no idea what that would be good for. Uh, but, so but, you mean if the intensity is not changing like at the same, at the same rate for center and surround, but if you have different, different changes in illuminance, for example? Yeah, let's say, let's say you're up in a region where you're, you're at the top of the rod activation level, and then you're modulating the contrast there, you'll get more modulation of the surround of the center than the surround. Yeah, and I see. Is, is, that, is that useful? Yeah, I think the question about how all of that is useful, like in the end for the animal or in what specific lightning conditions and scene conditions it would be useful is uh, very interesting. But I'm not really sure how to easily address that except for like really performing behavioral experiments in the end. I mean, we can of course like uh, quantify the dependence of center and surround on luminance and so on, but in the end to see for what specific con sp conditions it would be helpful, it's like a really difficult question, I think, to address. Yeah, I mean, is there any reason to think that that's any more or less useful than the chromatic surround? So what do you mean exactly with that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm agreeing with your point that it's yeah. that it's hard, it's hard to know which which feature of this would be most useful to the, an to the animal, whether yeah. the you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not, yeah, hi. Hi, uh, great talk, uh, Catherine. Uh, quick Thank question, you. so how, how is surround changing from dorsal to ventral? Uh, uh, what, what, what do you think the uh, mechanism could be? How is the surround changing from dorsal well, to you, ventral? Well, uh, uh, if I understood correctly, you say, you, you show that, that the surround in the dorsal is more towards UV, is that correct? The ventral is more towards uh, uh, green. Yeah. So is it, is it the cellular component change or how does that, how does that work? Yeah. yeah, especially for the uh, bipolar cell data, we see that the surround preference is like nearly inverted to the center preference, although right, right. in the dorsal retina, it's like quite balanced, meaning that um, you have, um, it responds to both um, colors, but a little bit stronger to UV. But how this is really uh, modulated, so we have done, we have started to do some um, pharmacolo pharmacology experiments where we specifically block different kinds of amar green cell subgroups and then see how this affects the surround. And um, so for example, in the ventral retina, we find that the bipolar cell, so the green component of the surround is not mediated by amar green cells, but is only um, abolished when you also block horizontal cells, while the UV component of the surround for these cells is blocked when you block amar green cells. So it seems like they receive input or inhibitory inputs from or the surround is mediated partly by horizontal cells, which is green dominant in the ventral retina, and partly by amar green cells, which is UV dominant in the ventral retina. But I mean, how exactly this is in the dorsal retina, we, have, we didn't uh, systematically address these questions yet. Thanks. Um, just a quick comment, uh, one cell to play with there in terms of the color potency of the surround might be the on delayed cell that we worked on. So it's not published in our paper, but we've since messed around with that cell a bit. And it, it, it appears that the far surround disinhibition, that gamma B disinhibition component appears to be UV shifted. Oh, so that okay. may be a place to look for a UV. How does, how does the cell look? I mean, morphologically? 
It's the um, type 7-3 in iWire. It's the um, okay. recursively bi-stratified one. Oh, yeah, so it's a bi-stratified one. It's bi-stratified, and yeah, it's not exactly in the bottom, but yeah, it's bi-stratified in layer 7 and 3, and it's um, there. there's a pretty good match to it in, in your chirp data, I believe. I'll have to look at exactly which one it is, yeah. but... Because it's so yeah, delayed that, that that's the key. Like uh, for an on step, it's got almost a half second latency. So that, oh, that I see. Yeah, it's really slow. Okay. So, so I'm intrigued. So I think in the 2017 paper, we showed something. Was it the ons or the offs have a slightly bigger receptive field? One of them, the bipolar cells. Yes. So. Yes. Given that the dendrites of those bipolar cells between on and off are not all that different, wouldn't then the assumption be that that's because one of the group gets a bigger surround than the other, or stronger surround or something, which then makes the receptive field different size. So can the same thing possibly be linked to the fact that you're seeing more opponency in the offs? Yeah, so I get your point. So I think that's actually the case that the off bipolar cells, I mean, they have a stronger uh, green component of this around, right? And um, so, but your argument doesn't make sense because it's exactly the other way around, oh. you know? So what we found in the paper functionally is that the off bipolar cells have a larger receptive field than the on bipolar cells. But that would mean that off bipolar cells receive, let's say, relatively speaking, less surround, but now for the um, color data, we see the opposite. So one concrete, one hypothesis might be that, I mean, as I said, the bipolar cells, they seem to receive a part of this round comes from horizontal cells and a part from the amma green cells. And the relative contribution of these two surround pathways might differ for on and off cells. Okay. So yeah. Are there any yeah. clues to that in the, in the new gap junction data? between cone bipolar cells from uh, from Brian Jones or Robert Mark? I'm not sure. I have I would have to check. That that might contribute to the difference in the receptive field size as well. No. Or gap junctions in the inner retina, right? I mean, part of the receptive field of on bipolar cells is their gap junctions to A2s, right? Or yeah. All right, I will just intervene to say I'm going to hand the YouTube stream. So for YouTube people, thanks for watching and hope to see you next week for Thomas Alert. And Thank Greg, you, Matthew. That's, yeah. you. that's why I we think just... it would probably be between cone bipolars because 